All right, so that was uh, the agenda and introduction. Let's get into the actual um, session here. So it's been now 15 minutes. I've been already burning time. <laughs> uh, so yeah, our first session we did, uh, we, we, we discussed the term socialism and what that means and how it might, might mean different things to uh, different people on the left and how, you know, maybe there's an adjective in front of it. Um, kind of briefly talked about like how it's kind of changed over, uh, over the years, over the decades. Um, you know, we talked about how, you know, it's an ideology, but also it's kind of a, a sense of belief, right? It's, uh, it's kind of a, a value to a degree for some people. It is kind of for me, like, uh, I'm trying my best not to like lately. I've been like, for me, I guess, and this is my opinion again, uh, with labels and whatnot, like, I am a blah, 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 socialist, blah, 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 whatever. Like taking those all aside and I'm not worrying about that anymore. It's more of just like, to me, like socialism is like a value that I'm trying, you know, try to uphold. And it actually ties into our term a little bit. I'm going to go deeper into that of, uh, you know, upholding your, your values, upholding your ideology. Right. Um, so yeah, we discussed, uh, socialism last time and, uh, our next term, our next subject, like I said, rhymes with Texas. It is praxis. Maybe you've heard of this word before. Maybe you're like me, and I, I think I've never heard of this word until probably last year, around this time, uh, when I first heard it, uh, you know, in a study circle. Um, I've never, uh, I don't think I've ever heard it in, like, really used in a, a in the sense that, of the definition that we're going to get close to, or at least discuss. Um, I may have, might have heard it, um, and maybe in like a, uh, uh, a different sense, but I don't remember that. <laughs> it, it sounds like a word that you might've heard before, but, um, yeah, praxis short word. Uh, and it comes from, at least from my notes and whatnot. <laughs> it's, it's been thrown around a lot in, uh, uh, philosophical conversations for a very long time um but before we get into that like is anyone in chat here if you want to drop in like what is praxis do you think means uh or maybe what it means to you um because i'm curious what your thoughts are because i have my own i always try to add like my own i guess definition to it um to this section here um but i guess i'll go over let me get this up on screen. Because uh, last time I liked using a uh, Merriam-Webster dictionary, because I think it's fun <laughs> to look at what is the, the dictionary's definition of it. And then is it, do we feel like it's correct or spot on? Or is it maybe not taking into account, you know, uh, uh, you know, what we're looking at. So let's get this on screen here. There we go. So yeah, praxis. A noun. So the first definition, action practice, such as exercise or practice of an art, science or skill, customary practice or conduct. So like I mentioned earlier, I don't think I heard this word before, but if I did hear it, it was probably in this kind of uh, use. Some sort of conduct, uh, a practice of an art, science or skill. Um, but the one, uh, one right here is actually kind of close to... I guess historically, um, from what I've read, is closer to what the definition is, which is a practical application of a theory. Um, here's uh, some, actually this one right here, is that kind of, I like how this is used in a sentence. In envisioning a socialist future for England, their praxis was extremely, uh, oh, sorry, was extreme hospitality. In envisioning a socialist future for England, their praxis was extreme hospitality. Um, so you can see how there's like, there's a theory to this, right? There's a, 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 some sort of value or ideology to praxis. So practice is a noun. Um, but I also like with this, with this definition here, action practice, I like the word action. I also do like the practice, but for me, like action, I think is at least when radical people talk about praxis to me is it, it's more in this realm of action. Um, but I do think to a degree it is also a type of 
practice, uh, you know, practicing what you preach, right? Um, so yeah, just thought this was a fun. It's always fun to look at the Merriam-Webster dictionary. Um, but yeah, uh, let's go to this link here. So this guy, who I just realized is a count, count Augustus or August. I'm assuming it's Augustus. Uh, I'm probably gonna butcher this. Delega Sitskowski. Um, from the 1800s, he was a Polish uh, philosopher, and uh, he's a, a Hegelian uh, philosophy specifically. But he influenced um, a lot of people uh, in that time, including Marx. Um, but I want to bring this guy up because um, he's one of the earliest uh, uh, philosophers to use the term praxis. And his definition uh, means, this is from his book called Prologomena zur Historisophie. I, I think something, uh, history, whatever. It's a history book that he wrote in 1838. Uh, action oriented towards changing society, and I, I'm going back to like talking about action again. Uh, he uses it in this sentence to describe it, to describe practice or praxis. Action oriented towards changing society. Um, I honestly think like this is like I said, it's 1838. I would argue to a degree like this action or this uh, definition, including the word action here, is pretty spot on. You know, it's a uh, praxis is a way of uh, pushing towards a society that you're looking for, that you want. Um, so you have that definition there. Then if we go to Marx, um, which uh, a couple decades later, I believe here, he refers praxis to, um, quote, to refer to the free universal creative and self-creative activity through which man creates and changes his historical world and himself. Praxis is an activity unique to man which distinguishes him from all other beings. So the, the almost like being human, the active, the uh, activity, the, once again, active, using that word active, or uh, action, uh, uh, you know, activity unique, I think of action, that distinguishes man from, you know, a dog, a cat, and whatnot. There is a, a thought process. There is a uh, a universal, you know, so he says free, universal, creative, and self-creative activity, the action to create the world uh, around him, create the world that he wants. So I think it's a little bit more wordy version of uh, what I kind of can see Augustus saying. Um, I think it's not a bad definition either. I don't think it's a bad definition at all. Um, I just, you know, like you add that second sentence of praxis is part of what makes man man versus animal. I think it's a whole other <laughs> can of worms, uh, to get into. Um, so you have, yeah, you have those two terms. And then for me, I'm going to share my kind of, I don't really have like a written definition. I kind of just have bullet points here. So to me, it's like kind of the 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 action, the kind of stuff that we do every day to create the world we want. So it isn't, you know, it is an action, but like, you know, it, can, it isn't always like, for a lot of people, it could mean mutual aid, but also can mean other things like just being anti-capitalist, like talking about it with your peers, with your comrades, with your, your family, your friends, uh, being anti-racist, anti-sexist those kind of things right um and it's you know it's more than it's like for me it's like the uh, you have your ideology you have your uh you know your uh, morality maybe your values right praxis is like the act the action of building the world based off the values the ideology you're 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 wanting so if i want to if i believe in a socialist world right that the world can be socialist praxis is the actions I'm taking to help push that, to have that happen. Um, and to me, like part of being, this is like another part, I guess, of my definition. That's very long already. Uh, part of being like a radical, you know, or whatever label works best for you. 
you know, it. I think a requirement of or part of that. I mean, uh, I would say a requirement is a uh, is praxis, right? You're applying your beliefs into action. You're applying theory into action. Um. So yeah, uh, praxis. It's it. Such for such a quick word, it, I feel like it means a lot, and uh, and yeah, just to tie all these definitions together, it's really just you know the uh, you know theory to theory to action, your your values into action, your socialist values into action, your radical values into action, you know, um, and we'll get into it uh, in a bit. Uh, there's actually one video I have in our video section there where we talk about where they'll talk about uh like what what's what's like what's activism to what's uh to what's praxis you know because i think those terms can kind of be used to a degree like people are activists you know is that is that being praxis you know that's a for me that's a i don't i go back and forth of i feel like it's kind of they can kind of be used interchangeably because i think activists are usually doing things before either social or political uh reasons they're not just doing it for the sake of doing it um, but to me praxis i think is much more broader you know activism is a chunk of praxism uh or being praxis or doing praxis rather so um we'll get into that uh later but maybe you've thought about that <laughs> while i've been reading uh these definitions and sharing uh, all these adjectives uh to describe praxis um you know, uh, it is, I to me, I think it, like I said, I go back and forth, but I think it is, activism is part of praxis. Um, so yeah, that, that is our term, uh, term for, uh, today, praxis. But yeah, feel free to drop in chat if, uh, maybe if this is the first time you've heard of this word, uh, or maybe you heard of this word in the past and maybe used in a different way, uh, let me know. Cause I'm like I said, I'm very curious to see how many people have heard of this word. Uh, like I said, I haven't heard of this word until about like like I said, probably a year ago, and it came up in a uh, in a uh, book I was reading in a, a study circle. I remember we had a discussion about it because I never never heard of this word. All right, let's. Uh, and then we had that quick dump of information. Um, let's take a second to break the ice a little bit more. And uh, let's watch some funny... Well, this is funny. If, well, I don't even know if I can fully play this because it has a... Uh, <laughs> it possibly has copyright music. So I might have to keep it really low and you'll have to imagine in your head. Uh, and then there's some other stuff in here that is more like good news. Um... And there's this one, uh, yeah, one article here. And there's this one video, yeah. So, yeah, we have a lot. We have actually a decent amount here. So, the first thing I wanted to show, first thing I wanted to show was, um, and you've probably seen it if you're on Twitter or in the political Twitter, I guess, scene. <laughs> um, there was a, a video that came out from, uh, I think it's from, like, yeah, an Irish news network. Because uh, President of the United States, Joseph Robinette Biden, uh, visited Ireland. Um, I don't know why he was visiting there. I didn't really look into that. But he was in Ireland. And he was doing a speech outside of one of Ireland's churches or whatnot. And, you know, there's a crowd there for him and whatnot. They're excited, right? They're excited for uh, Biden to be here. Um, but I've never seen anything like this. This, this video is, <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna play it. So yeah, I might have to lower the music on this just so it doesn't get copyright claimed, but this is a freaking WWE entrance. Please welcome a son of Adana and the 46th president of the United States, Joe Biden. <laughs> See, the music plays. They're going crazy up here. And he's coming out like he's in WWE. It's freaking amazing. <laughs> it's just great. 
I'm gonna turn it down just a little bit more because I don't want to get the stream flagged. But yeah, he's you know does a salute a wave, a salute wave there. You have your uh, <laughs> just the mix of flags. It's so weirdly hype. Like once again, like obviously we don't like Biden, right? But this is this is this is funny as fuck. <laughs> But yeah, the the music is honestly for me like this is close to uh, the the clip of in terms of just like <laughs> how goofy this is and how funny this is uh, to the clip of Trump of uh, when uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died where he comes off the plane and the reporters tell him that she died. You know he does he's like oh I didn't know that and there's like uh, tiny dancers playing in the background like same energy. I don't think it's as good as that, but it, this is up there. This is definitely a top five Biden clip. The, like the lights and everything. There is a lot of people there. Mary, I see the light. Oh, so it's Mayo, Ireland. It's great to be here with you all. <laughs> it's great to be back in Baltimore during your 300th anniversary. So, yeah. I, I'll link this in chat because it's definitely worth the watch with the full volume. Uh, when I put it in our list here, I was like, well, I don't know if I can play all this, but yeah, Dropkick Murphy's song definitely probably would have been flagged. I hope it didn't get flagged. We'll see after this VOD goes up, but, uh, so yeah, that was a funny thing that happened, uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, some of the stuff is more recent here they have next. So actually let me close this tab. It's a bunch of tabs here. So, uh, this is, um, it's going to start off bad. Um, in terms of, uh, I know as I said, good news and funny things. Um, uh, but it, trust me, this will pay off. Um, so, yeah, in case you're just not maybe uh, paying attention, I guess, uh, there is trans genocide happening in uh, the United States, especially in states like Florida, where they've been constantly signing laws and whatnot, uh, you know, banning, whether it's banning drag or banning uh, health care. Uh, to even, uh, like here in Missouri, where you can, uh, through the Attorney General's site, you can report concerns, concerns, uh, about, you know, gender transition intervention and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, just basically having a form so you can, uh, you know, have the police come knock on your neighbor's door because they're trans. Um, it's just, it just fucked up. Um, but yeah, Elm Fork John Brown Gun Club tweeted this. Um, we are now in the turn your neighbor into the state for being trans, state of genocide. Also, you have some free time. Please feel free to fuck up this disgusting police state and former website. And uh, yeah, so this site was up for like two days. And here, here's the good news. Uh, shit doesn't work anymore. They deleted it. Uh, you cannot get to it anymore. Um, people bombarded it. They, uh, they, uh, you know, just spammed the form over and over again until they got rid of it. So, uh, just freaking amazing work <laughs> from, uh, uh, the, an online community here to, uh, get rid of this form. So, yeah, I just wanted to share this, but yeah, I would re highly recommend following, um, uh, you know, some trans activists on Twitter or whatnot, or wherever social media you have. Um, Cause there's a lot of stuff happening um, right now that uh, it's fucking scary. Uh, I remember I did a, uh, um, when I was doing some, uh, uh, getting like screen grabs for my uh, video last year, uh, my like kind of uh, intro video to, um, my Dark Souls charity stream for Trans uh, Lifeline there. Like, you know, just reading all the articles and whatnot and finding, you know, headlines for that. Uh, shit is worse 
no like it has not gotten better it is really really scary to be a trans person uh in the united states so um yeah just we need to start really paying attention and start if anything doing praxis doing action and uh whatnot i'm really hoping to do another um charity stream soon i've been looking into it uh i'm just kind of trying to find a good time to do it um and i really want to like because we, we raised a lot of money last time i want to raise i want to raise the bar you know what's up usernames political stream uh yes so this is uh the second session of uh we grow together which is like a i started last month kind of doing one episode a month right now or sorry one session a month um kind of like focusing on specific topics but right now we're in our section called like the either like good news or um or just fun stuff section of the stream. We just uh, did like kind of an introduction about the term praxis, which is what we're gonna focus on mostly today, but kind of doing like a quick side note, kind of add, well, there's some stuff X actually related, but um, yeah, just kind of uh, breaking the ice a little bit. So we're gonna, after this, we're gonna get into kind of more of like reading a little bit, which is, could be, I know, dry for some people. It's dry for me sometimes. So then we'll watch some videos. But yeah, in case you're also on Twitter, because um, I'm I'm on Twitter too much. It doesn't help that my job is to do social media. So, um, But yeah, the whole checkmark thing has been really funny to see. Uh, Elon Musk had Twitter uh, on 420 um, switch over. Uh, got basically got rid of all the checkmarks on Twitter. And you had to pay $8 to get it. But there's been a... Uh, a campaign kind of started by um, at Drill, which is a great uh, Twitter account. It's been around for a long time. Um, I'm not going to read this whole article here out loud, um, but I will drop this in chat if you want to read it. Uh, but basically, yeah, uh, at Drill and a couple other, uh, I guess, Twitter personalities or Twitter accounts are kind of doing a uh, block the blue campaign. Basically blocking everybody who has, you know, like Elon here, has the check mark. I started doing it uh, manually, which kind of sucks. I know there's probably some scripts to do it or something like that. But uh, <laughs> it's been really funny. Like this tweet here, like jealous of my $8. <laughs> but like, I think I've blocked at least 300 people last night. Um I went under like Jason Alexander's uh, Twitter because he, he tweeted that he was leaving. And then like, of course, everyone's like all the people who bought, you know, the check marks are all under there saying stuff to him. So I just went through and blocked like a whole list of them. So and I will say so far, it hasn't been too many people popping up on my on my feed who have the blue check mark. Um, but yeah, it's a whole big campaign. Um and uh, there was an account that was called uh, Block the Blue, and that got banned. And then Twitter updated their terms of service to say you can't, quote unquote, harass people who have uh, a blue check mark, that they're putting that as harassment. Uh, then they also, going back to the, 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 the trans, you know, issues that have been, you know, the, the human right violations, um, obviously. Uh, Twitter isn't, you know, quote unquote real life, but Twitter got rid of, uh, got rid of like, uh, under their like hate speech. They got rid of like, um, like being, you know, having hate speech towards uh, trans folk. Um, so, but to be fair, hate speech is, uh, not to be fair, sorry, not the right words. Uh, hate speech has already been going up more and more on Twitter. It's always been there. But now it's like much more out in the open. People are paying eight dollars and just being openly fascist. Uh, there was one I saw of uh, of uh, someone like saying that, like on four twenty, um, saying that uh, you know, however many years ago Hitler was born on this day, and you know, promoting like how much of a great leader he was. So yeah, just great things are happening on Twitter. That platform is gonna die. Maybe by the end of this year, we'll see. Uh, sticking with Twitter though, um, if you're going to stay on Twitter, um, recommend following, uh, Iridescence here. I think I pronounced their name right. Um, uh, they've been doing, it's every like month or so they, they do, uh, 
um, a bunch of like drawings of different like anarchist animals, and then they vote. People vote on what the next animal will be. Right now, it's goats. Uh, and this was my favorite one from this month, um, where it says we all have a part in building a world beyond hierarchy. And you have uh, all these different goats who do different things. One's a builder, a fighter. One's a medic, health aid, and a carer. Uh, one's a messenger, safety, gardener, scientist, uh, visionary, crafter, creator. Um, and then the arrows are like, oh, they're all part of community defense. You know, uh, which is just, I don't know. I just really like their, <laughs> I've always like these. They always uh, give me a little smile on my face. So uh, definitely go check them out. They're also on Instagram as well. Uh, then I found this video like literally today. Um, so yeah, 420 obviously was on Thursday and, uh, you know, we all celebrate that. And this was in, uh, this was in Detroit. So I think based off what I've, from what I've learned from this, that, uh, like smoking weed or whatever, you know, uh, having weed is legalized. It's legalized in, uh, Detroit, I think last year. So it's like a big 420 was like extra big, I guess, this year. But yeah, just check out this. This is from uh, the local news. Don't worry, I shall boycott Twitter over this. I don't remember my pass or what email the account used. I only ever tweeted like five things. Appell to in solidarity. I mean, at this point, don't even log in. You're already helping. It's not being on me. If anything, I'm probably not helping being on Twitter as much as I am. Uh, <laughs> but um, at least I'm blocking blocking a bunch of people, but I try not to use it as much anymore, but I get so much of my news. And as you can see here, how much stuff I have, that's just Twitter. Um, but I think Twitter, I don't know if, if it's going to be one day where Twitter just dies or anything like that. I just think everyone's going to leave. It's if it, people already have been leaving, but like you had NPR and, uh, PBS leave once like news networks start leaving, then a lot of people are going to leave Twitter. Cause that's what a lot of people use it for. I'm here on the west side of Detroit celebrating 420 day. It is a, uh, hey, Jay. J <laughs> it's a beautiful thing, man. Beautiful thing. Smoking on the news. Smoke it, man. Smoking on the news. <laughs> you hit it, man. That holiday. I wish he tried it, dude. 420, April 20th, celebrate. He'd get fired, but I wish they would. Let How are you do celebrating it, it today? Like this, you know what I'm saying? Smoking weed, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Get out. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. Everybody Just, I love the cuts. They're I so the good. <laughs> like many on the weed bar bus from Eastern Market to here. It's first stop at weed the bar. Detroit Herbal Center on Detroit's west side. Free weed. Who wants the weed? And many Just passing it out. This year, it's awesome. Smoking pot for recreation is legal. And business is good. Business has been good. Yeah, you making you know money? I can't complain. Is it cheaper now? Heck yeah, way cheaper. I'm saying like the gang saturated. But, you know, they're talking about the business side. Uh, I don't really give a fuck about the business side. Like, I know there's, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, pro-capitalist folk will be like, you know, they will they want to legalize weed for the, the sense of like, it'll be good for the economy or whatever. I want to legalize weed uh and everywhere because uh one it's it's safer than uh drinking um and two also like free everybody who's been put in jail for it uh and used uh you know as part of the uh prison industrial complex no so like everybody can afford it and further on the west side on the corner of warren and greenfield the herbalist cannabis company is celebrating 420 the holiday uh, that only matters to a lot of people in detroit 420 420 all the time it's not I don't, I don't think so usernames not just today it's mostly every day and with all this pot most places are giving away free burgers or cinnabons or sandwiches how was it? I want one of those burgers. Charlie, listen to me. I ain't gonna lie to you. Amazing. You gotta grab one of them Jones. So, with the munchies satisfying, feeling good, it's back on the weed bus for another 420 celebration in the D. Look at me, Mom. I made it. On Detroit's west side, Charlie <laughs> Langton, Fox 2 weed, News. I like how it ends with, you want some weed, Charlie? <laughs> No, it was just a. I just thought it was fun because people are celebrating 420. This was actually my first year. Um, 
is my first year uh, celebrating 420, all right? Because I never really did anything up until last year. And I don't think I did anything for last year, but, you know, I did some did some 420 activities this year. No, they didn't say that. No. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Trust me. Um, so there's that. Uh, I think, is that all of it? I thought I had something else. Maybe that is it. I mean, it was a lot. There was a lot of fun stuff here. But I think that's it. Because I think we're on to the... Yeah. Let's make sure. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, no, they didn't. Uh, okay. So yeah, this next section here. So that was our fun half. Maybe I should have got a couple more things. They went by kind of quick. I thought that'd be a little bit longer. But uh, like I said, this is second episode, second session. We're rolling. Um, roll with what we got. Uh, buh, buh, buh. so yeah, back to Praxis, right? Praxis, you know the 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 action of applying theory, you know, applying theory into action, applying your beliefs into action, uh, values uh, into action. Um, you know, that's what the word praxis generally means um, or has mean at least in a radical sphere right uh, and going back I'm going to reiterate uh, our guy Augustus quote because I think I, the more I read it the more I like it action oriented towards changing society so with that we're going to look at some I found there's a lot of because I was trying to find like a lot of uh, more general articles and whatnot, and there's a lot of uh, articles that have so it's hard to search for that kind of stuff because there's a lot of articles about just like praxis being used um, you know in terms of like a specific historical event or whatnot uh, which is fine but some of it was just like way too long there's also just talk about like praxis and theory and just getting way into the weeds with that so we might be jumping a lot, around a lot with this um, so apologies for that um, I mostly read all these, some of these things I had to skim because they're just super long, but maybe there's a section that I really liked. Um, the first one we're going to look at here um, is, uh, blah, blah, blah. let's get this up. There we go. So it's What is Praxis? And I believe it's by, who wrote this? Does it say at the bottom? Uh, is it Mark K. Smith? I think. Someone uploaded this, but... Um, And it just kind of talks about uh, uh, how it's loosely been, uh, if I remember correctly. Yeah, this is like, I, one I want to just, I'll, fuck, I'm just going to read. Fucking slipping over here. A uh, few educators speak of praxis. Those uh, that do tend to uh, link into the work of Freire, which Freire is a, I believe it was a, an Italian philosopher. a Brazilian educator philosopher um, uh, while practice may not be part of many workers overt vocabulary practice a pale derivative derivative is uh, so what is praxis and why should educators be concerned with it um, where was the section I wanted in this yeah right here there's almost like a uh, they kind of argue that there's kind of four things that go into uh, uh, committed action. So people will begin with a situation or question which they consider in relation to what they think makes for human flourishing, so the good. Uh, they are guided by a moral uh, disposition to act truly and rightly. Uh, fro I don't even know what that word is. I haven't seen that word before. Uh, learning a lot of things today. Um, yeah, what does that mean? Phronesis. Phronesis. Wisdom and determining ends and the means of attaining them. Okay. We should do another episode or a session on that. 
Um, this enables them to engage with the situation as committed thinkers and actors. And this is where the practice comes in. And the interaction, the outcome is a process. Um, like I said, this kind of we're getting a little bit into like the theory stuff. Um, uh, was it here? Where the production begins with a planner design, the practical cannot have such a concrete starting point. Instead, we begin with a question or situation. We then start to think about this situation in the light of our understanding of what is good or what makes for human flourishing. Thus, for Aristotle, if we're going to go all the way that far, uh, praxis is guided by a moral disposition to act truly or rightly, a concern to further human well-being and the good life. This is what Greeks called phronesis. Oh, I guess I could have just read this. And it requires an understanding of other people. Practical wisdom, or phronesis, involves moving between the particular and the general. The mark of a prudent man uh, is be able to deliberately rightly about what is good and what is advantageous for himself, non-particular uh, respects, what is good for health or physical strength, but what is conductive, uh, yeah, conduct, no, that's not conductive, Con conductive to the good life generally. What is conductive? Dude, we're gonna, we got to be Googling all the words today. Making a certain situation or outcome likely or possible. Conducive. Conducive. Oh, I've definitely heard that word now. Okay. As you can see, I'm not the best. Uh, read a louder. Read a louder. Uh, but what is uh, conducive to the good life generally? Aristotle. Um, in praxis, there can be no prior knowledge of the right means by which we realize the end in a particular situation. For the end itself is only specified in deliberating about the means appropriate to a particular situation. Berns uh, Bernstein. Uh, as we think about what we want to achieve, or we alter the way we might achieve that, as we think about the way we might go about something, we change what we might aim at, that there is a continual interplay between ends and means. In just the same way, there's a continual interplay between thought and action. This process involves interpretation, understanding, and application in one unified process. It is something we engage in as human beings and is directed at other human beings. Let me get to our little thing here. We can now see that the full quality of praxis is not simply action based on reflection. It is action which embodies certain qualities, like I was talking about before. These include a commitment to human well-being and the search for truth and respect for others. It is the action of people who are free, who are able to act for themselves. Moreover, practice, praxis is always risky. It requires that a person makes a wise and prudent practical judgment about how to act in this situation. Um, and pedagogy... Gadoti, I don't know some of the, most of these people, uh, writes, the practice is the horizon, the aim of the theory. Therefore, the educationalist lives the instigating dialectic between his or her daily life, the lived school, and the projected school, which attempts to aspire a new school. I probably should do a session on the word dialectic, because I still don't freaking understand fully what that word means, but it's used all the time. Uh, especially if you ever read uh, Capital uh, and whatnot. It's it's a, it's a meaty word. Uh, as Paul Taylor has written, we can say that word and action, action and reflection, theory and practice are all facets of the same idea. This action is not merely uh, merely the doing of something. What Freire describes as activism and Aristotle as uh, poesis. Poesis is about uh, po poesis uh, is about acting upon doing to is about working uh, with objects. Praxis, however, is creative. It is other seeking and dialogic. Praxis, praxis, praxis. <laughs> um, yeah, here's the link here. Please remind me if I don't post the link in chat. Um, yeah, this is a little bit deep. Like I said, some of the stuff a little bit in the weeds, but I did feel like this one kind of um, briefly describes like you know some different ways people have used the term in the more theory. Uh, you know, in, in history here. But it, like we said, it's kind of the, what we pulled from before when we talked about the top, which is, you know, it's a uh, it's a process. A praxis is, you know, applying your theory, applying your values. Um, I don't know if I fully agree with it requires a person to make a wise and prudent practical judgment. I mean, I get what, what they're trying to say. I mean, because I guess you can argue that praxis isn't just a specifically a leftist thing. You can be on the right, I guess, and do praxis. 
um, I mean, fascists, I guess, do praxis by, you know, doing fascist stuff. <laughs> um, but still pretty good. Uh, which one did I want to read next? Yeah, I guess we'll just go in the order. Yeah, so then, then this one here, I don't know if I'm going to... This one's a little bit longer. Um, but this one's basically uh, about... Uh, from uh, Nicole uh, Ashoff. Um, of why they are a feminist and a socialist. Um, and they briefly talk about like praxis here, but I think this one looking at from kind of uh, further out here is how like, once again, they're talking about their values, you know, a values of being a feminist values of being a socialist, you know, of their ideology and why they're, what they're, you know, kind of talking about that. And then talking about like why we fight for the things we fight for because we believe in these things. Um, all right, start at the top here. Feminism and capitalism are both in crisis, not a crisis in the sense that the constellation of norms, ideas, and practices that under, uh, undergird, uh, sorry, undergird capitalism or feminism in the danger of collapse, um, but rather a crisis in the sense that we have reached an inflection point. The variant of capitalism dubbed neoliberalism has in the eyes of many lost legitimacy. There is widespread disgust with the institutions and flag bearers of the status quo. The centrist voices that have shaped common sense for the past few decades and today insist in the face of yawning inequality and catastrophic climate change. Happy Earth Day, by the way. It's snowing here in Denver. Definitely having climate change stuff happening today. Uh, that the only way forward is to preserve the core elements of neoliberalism and being forced to share the airways with populists on both the left and right who think otherwise. Feminism, for its part of being decried, is simultaneously ineffective and blinkered. What for decades women in wealthy countries have been told are the core goals of feminism. Wage parity, equal representation in political and economic life, the right to illegal safe abortion, have n either not been achieved or are under threat. Uh, this was written in 2019, I believe, this article. Sorry, 2020, early 2020. Um... So keep that in mind with what they're saying, because this still applies to today, especially in the United States. Um, moreover, moreover, for a growing number of women, particularly poor and working class women, and women living in the global south, these goals feel insufficient or not attuned to the realities of everyday life. For many, mainstream feminism, uh, like a project shaped around the needs and desire of privileged women, uh, crisis means opportunity, however. Right now, in this, uh, right now in this moment of political uncertainty, there's an opening, a remapping of the possible. People are looking for new ideas and asking hard questions about the nature and direction of the horizon we seek. What is the horizon of feminism? Can capitalism and fem feminism coexist? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, to address these questions productively, we must remember that, this, that, that feminism is not a cut and dry political program. It is a political struggle. We often forget or allied, uh, allied this fact, which results in confusion all around. Characterizing feminism as a political struggle highlights the obvious but essential point that women often have radically divergent political worldviews. We think if we think that capitalism, with some tweaks here and there, uh, the mo the most just and appealing system, the best way to organize our planet, the planet, sorry, our feminism will reflect this worldview. This feminism struggle will orbit around goals to give women opportunities and rewards within capitalism equal to those accorded men. Uh, this feminism this feminism will strive to realize conditions that allow each woman to compete in the marketplace and to maximize their human capital. But there are also those of us whose feminism is shaped by anti-capitalist politics. If we think that capitalism is destroying the livability of our planet and preventing the vast majority of people from living a decent life, let alone reaching their full potential, our feminism will demand something beyond tweaks to the status quo that in practice benefit mostly white women of a professional uh, managerial bent. This feminism will offer a vision of liberation beyond the narrow pathways of pay work and political representation. I guess we're just going to read this whole thing. It looks like a lot of text, but we're getting through it. Uh, is women's liberation getting the corner office or at least a genuine chance to get the corner office? Or do we believe that women's liberation is the ability for all people to have justice, dignity, and security? Most visions of women's liberation share some key assumptions. We broadly agree that all women should have, have access to food and, depending on your politics, some standard of health care and education. We also agree that all women should have equal protection under the law from abuse and violence. 
but we quickly reached a point of divergence. Beyond that, our answers to the question of what does women's liberation mean to me suggest distinct political projects. There is no, there is not one feminist horizon. Our various definition of women's liberation formed through tears and, uh, so formed through, uh, tears and triumphs across space and time, rooted in decades of theory and praxis, point the way toward different horizons. There's our word. Um, and we can see here how theory and praxis are separated. You know, uh, like a, we'll watch a video where they kind of talk about, you know, theory versus praxis. Um, the dominant feminist project of the past few decades has encouraged us to forget this fact. Proponents of mainstream feminism have worked hard to collapse the myriad feminisms of the world, each rooted in a different political worldview and a different vi uh, vision of women's liberation into one vision of feminism that aligns neatly with the preoccupations and proclivities uh, of our for-profit system. This version of feminism defines women's liberation as equality with men in the hierarchy of power. It makes a few moves to challenge, let alone dismantle, it makes few moves, sorry, it makes few moves to challenge, let alone dismantle this hierarchy. However, instead, mainstream feminism is mostly concerned with distribution, focused on making room for women in upper tiers, rather than pushing for gains that would help all women, such as single-payer health care, guaranteed housing, free public higher education, universal pre-K, and... Oops, sorry. Burp, universal pre-K and a living wage. This doesn't mean that pro-capitalist visions or versions of feminism are somehow inauth inauthentic or without value. Markets can empower women, and the real feminist gains have been made within capitalism. These gains weren't a re result of capitalism, obviously, but they were one following struggles within capitalism. Ultimately, though, by failing or failing to challenge the uh, divisive drives of capitalism, dominant versions of feminism offer a stifled version vision of women's liberation. In this moment, we could, should seize this political opening and fight for feminism that doesn't prop up our destructive for-profit system. Uh, and here, here's the section I was looking forward to. Um, the feminism I the feminism I fight for does not snuggle comfortably in the lap of capitalism and is rooted in the understanding that capitalism is the problem. And that a feminism rooted in democratic, e egalitarian, and anti-capitalist principles is the solution. The answer to the oppression of women and children and men, the answer to destruction of our air and oceans and wild spaces, and to the muzzling of our solidarity and creativity. So right here for me, sorry, you hear that? It's the cat getting fed. Um, right here to me is like part of the praxis right here, you know, saying what the problem is and saying, you know, what, you know, their, their values, why, why, why we need to destroy capitalism, why we need to, you know, destroy, um, yeah, destroy capitalism and why feminism is rooted, you know, in the values that they have, um, Make no mistake, my feminism wants women to earn equal wages and sit in the halls of power, but also wants much more than this. It demands liberation from the economic and political structures that prevent the vast majority of women and men from living a good life. My, fe fem my feminism strong. believes that the goal can be only achieved through anti-capitalist struggle. Thanks for the follow. Appreciate it. Um, it is a feminism that encompasses and embraces union drives and living wage campaigns. Efforts to recognize and reward unpaid reproductive labor. Movements building a just transition to green energy, fights against racism, racism and fight uh, for LGBTQ rights, and efforts to decommodify the necessities of life. Um, yeah, once again, this is this is to me is like talking about doing praxis, right? Maybe you don't like my version of feminism. Perhaps you have your own vision of women's liberation that looks very differently. You may not have a crystallized uh, political worldview at all. That's okay. Developing ro robust, powerful feminisms requires us to listen to other women and young people, and maybe a few men, about their hopes and dreams, their values and fears, their priorities and struggles, listening without jumping to judgment or offense. Feminism is not a map to a utopia that someday we'll all get to and live happily, ha happily ever after in. Sorry, let me read that again. Feminism is not a map to a utopia that someday we'll all get to and live happily ever after in. It's a centuries-old struggle for liberation. I'll be fighting and so should you. Like, yeah, this is talking about their ide ideology and mentioning here, like, what are some things that, you know, that we can do that, you know, some, some praxis, you know, going back to our term. Uh, yeah, this is a really good article. Uh, let me link it in the chat here. And if you're watching the YouTube version of this, whenever it's up, I'll, it'll be in the description. 
And if it's not, yell at me. Yeah, so that was Nicole uh, Ashoff. I don't know if they still write anymore. When I was looking, it looks like they stopped writing in last year. So um, I don't know where to find them, but maybe if you Google them, they'll, they'll pop up. Uh, we have two more articles here. This one I don't think I'm going to read because I all of it at least because it's pretty long and beefy but it is uh just talking about um kind of because we we're talking about like how ideology can make praxis um and here there was one section i remember reading they're really talking about was it right here yeah this section here so basically let me highlight it so don't forget it Basically, this article is about a um, a community group that wasn't necessarily like had a fully political like ideology behind it. They weren't like, you know, reading theory and then deciding to make a community farm. They kind of were just doing it uh, autonomously, doing it organically, um, you know, and they kind of made their own systems. Um, so I guess like, you know. So this kind of goes against like the definition we kind of talked about. And I think this is where the kind of the confusion I think comes from. And maybe there's a debate that needs to be had of like, does praxis need to be necessarily political in the sense of like, I am a socialist. I am doing praxis. Like, can it just be more like, I just want to help my community. I believe in the value of community. So I'm going to do, I'm going to be doing action, which is part of the definition we talked about doing action uh, to do, to get our, our world, to get my community to a better place. What is praxis? That is what this whole thing is about. Um, <laughs> yeah. So like, uh, at the top of the stream, we kind of looked at some definitions that, uh, like Marx has said, um, and kind of like my own definition. Uh, the one that we've kind of been going with is generally speaking is the action of, uh, of applying, so applying theory to action, applying your values to action, um, but most of the time it's talked about in a political way uh, or, or a theory way. So like this article here, um, to me, I didn't, like I said, I've read a good chunk of this, but I don't know if I'm going to read all of it. Um, but basically they're saying, actually, let me just go to the quote. I lost it. But I think like one I, confusing thing about praxis is that some for some, I think, and I think there's a good argument for it, is it doesn't necessarily have to be a specific ideology it doesn't have to be you are a socialist i think you can do praxis and be uh you know i think fascists do praxis sometimes right so i think it's less about i think people tend to think it's a leftist thing specifically when i think it's just more of a word to use to describe putting theory to action um so I hope that made sense um let me go back to my original quote here actually just for folks maybe popping in um so uh augustus here who I, his last name, I'm not going to try to pronounce again. Um, this is from like the 1830s. He wrote, Praxis is action oriented towards changing society. Um, so yeah, kind of going back to that, just applying theory into action. Uh, applying your, I, to me, it's more applying your beliefs because I think, like I said, you can maybe not necessarily be quote unquote political, you know, not being a socialist, but still, you know, believe in bettering the world, right? And uh, maybe you're doing that in your own way. But I still think that as leftists, we should use that word more often because that's the best way. Um, yeah, it's not like an object. No, no. It's it's a uh, it's a noun, I guess. You know, it's describing a type of action. Um, yeah, here's Marx's label again, or Marx's definition again. Um, uh, to refer to the free, universal, creative, and self-creative activity uh, through which man creates and changes his historical world and himself. Um, there was another part that says praxis is an activity unique to man, which distinguishes him from all other beings, which. Yeah, it's like a, yeah, I guess like an application. Yeah. So um, for me, I think the quickest way to say it is like applying theory into action, applying beliefs into action, values into action. Um, so like if you want to be, you know, if someone is a uh, really cares about the environment them doing anything to 
help promote the environment is praxis. Um, I know like in my study circle that I do, um, we I, we kind of jokingly throw out throw around praxis that like but things that clearly probably aren't praxis. So it'll be like watching this movie that has nothing to do with anything politics, right? We're like, this is actually praxis because, you know, we make an argument for it. So, um, uh, but yeah, going back to this, um, so Charis, which is the group, um, that is like running this community, uh, basically garden here. Uh, the major emphasis of Charis was exemplary action and praxis. In the words of Victor Sanchez, a prison organizer and former member of Charis, or Charis, uh, the concept is based on the practice of self-reliance and self-determination. We do not deal with ideology or false pride. We, we are about work. To be sure, when you talk about community development, in the long run, you're talking about controlling the police, the school, everything Sanchez admitted. We are aware of the fact that we live in a country full of contradictions. We don't need any more contradi contradictions among ourselves. So we try to set an example of how things can be done. Uh, so... Uh, okay, so let's continue. The practice centers on everyday life, Sanchez, Sanchez explained. Do you eat today? Do you have heat? We are open. Indeed, we have been accused of being liberal, too open, too vulnerable, but it's not liberalism, he insisted. We just don't want our organization to be used as a platform for someone's ideology. The rejection of sectarian ideology should not be misinterpreted as anti-intellectualism or ignorance. Rather, it was a conscious choice to develop a politics based in direct action or reconstructive vision and a recognition of the uh, in at Jesus Christ. So I'm tipping my tongue how to say this word. In inadequacies of sectarian political theory and dealing with the particulars of this situation. But yeah, if you want to hear more about this group, um, like I said, I read, I think, the first couple paragraphs, but um, I did read that section. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of talking about, like, how this group maybe isn't, like, necessarily political, right? But they're trying to make a better world, and that is praxis, like trying to make a better world as part of praxis as well. So maybe like maybe the definitions isn't so specific as theory. Maybe it's more of just once again the values isn't part of an ideology. Always it can just be values. Um, but yeah, I'll link I'll link that as well. Let me take a drink. Actually, I'm, I can feel my throat's gonna start dying soon. Sorry if we've been getting any drop frames. Um, I'm just gonna ban this guy. I don't even care. Bye. Um. Um. Yeah. Last. Last one here. This one once again. I don't think I'm gonna read too much from. This is talking about like uh, anarchist communist economics, which yeah can be a little little dry. Um. But there's a section here about praxis uh, and talking about our guy, uh, Freire, who I mentioned earlier. Um, so I'll read this section. Uh, praxis, Paul Freire defined praxis as reflection and action upon the world in order to transform it. This is to say that we should seek to act as revolutionaries through a consci conscious program of uniting our thinking about our actions and the impact they have. Theory, theory and practice should aim for a relationship of back and forth, testing and Sorry, testing and reassessing and building theory collectively out of the concrete struggles of the oppressed classes in action. As Marx says in the German ideology, communism is for us not a state of affairs, which is to be established. An ideal, uh, it is an ideal to which reality will have to adjust itself. We call communism the real movement, which abolishes the present state of things. The conditions of this movement result from the premises now in existence. Um, libertarian communist uh, perspective economics uh, has then has then been shaped by the belief in the potential leadership of the working class and popular classes and the commitment to uh, prescriptive economics reflecting both a strategy for achieving such an economy and a theory which reflects our experiences and struggle. The luminaries of libertarian and communist economics come from periods of intense class struggle. Uh, Kropotkin, uh, Berkman, Bordiga, the impossible socialists of the Second International, Socialism ou Barbarie, which I read... Uh, uh, I have a book actually that we read in our um, study circle about some of the stuff they wrote about. They're pretty interesting. Um, uh, God, I can't pronounce French stuff. Uh, de, de, 
Yak. Yeah, I'm not going to try it. Uh, Theorists of the CNT and Kefaro. I'll address critical issues in pre prescriptive no, prescriptive economics and do so from the strengths and weaknesses of the revolutionary moments they participate in. Um, yeah, it's going to keep going on and on, but this is... I just want to read mostly this section here uh, just because kind of going back to like what has been talked about from uh, you know different philosophers because it's one of the OG ones right here I guess so uh, but if you want to read more about uh, libertarian communism which is I guess closer to what my politics lie in um, but once again talking about like um, theory and practice that relationship creating praxis so freaking practice and praxis keep switching in my head um but yeah there's some more like like i said you can really dive into these articles and you can also find more articles but like i said there's a lot of practices thrown around a lot in a lot of theory stuff so you might go into the weeds with that it's not really my cup of tea um but yeah that's the reading section we did the homework all right we got through the uh the quote unquote boring stuff uh, like I said, I, I get it. I get it. Reading's dry sometimes, but I still think it's important to at least pull some things from it. Uh, how are we doing? Hour and 17 minutes. So we're a little bit quicker than last session. I think last session was what? Three hours? I think it was three hours. Let me look. I think, I think we did around three hours. Maybe I had a too little here. What's the difference between libertarian communism and libertarianism? So, like, yeah, that's... <laughs> I think I briefly talked about it last time. Uh, so, like, libertarianism, like, that libertarianism comes actually from left-leaning folks who are just anti-government. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of like, anarchists and whatnot will sometimes call themselves libertarians. Um, we're going into the whole label thing, too, which lately I mentioned at the top, like, I'm trying to be less label-y um, just because I feel like there's... You can pull from a lot of different, like, you know, parts of, uh, you know, theories of leftism and whatnot. And adding labels sometimes can get a little, just, you know, it gets, it gets into, like, just, you know, I don't know how to describe it. Just, like, you know, being online, for example, if you're like, I'm a, I'm a blah, blah, blah communist or I'm a blah, 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 you know, it just starts getting too much. Or, there, or it just gets like, oh, I'm an anarchist, so, like, that means everything you say is invalid. Or I'm a communists everything you say is invalid yeah semantics um so yeah, libertarian communism though specifically is to me like closer to anarchism in the sense that and uh, communism and anarchism to me are kind of interchangeable in my personal opinion you know it's stateless classless uh societies you know um you know moneyless societies uh i guess the biggest differentials from libertarian communists too is that uh compared to like other communists is that you know there's less of stages they just want to they don't want a state they want to abolish the state they believe more in autonomous uh you know workers movements yeah de deconstructing hierarchies right um i still think communism is being anti-hierarchy but i think anarchists making more emphasis on it um you know if you're more of the uh marxist leninist sense you believe more in stages right of communism you know socialism than communism uh so yeah, like anarchy is about to be constructing hierarchies. Libertarian communism, I would argue, is also in that same reign. It's like using interchangeable words. Um, but yeah, libertarianism to a lot of people now means like Ben Shapiro, uh, the Dave Rubens of the world, right? More of a right wing, pro capitalist, you know, open market. Um, you know that that that's why I don't like to use even use the word libertarian in, for myself because like people just think that. People just think, oh, you're just a racist, uh, you know, pro-capitalist person. So, uh, for me, like, anarchism, communism are interchangeable because the end goal is no state, no class, no money. You know, I don't want hierarchies. I don't want oppression. I don't want domination. So, that's kind of... Where it is. But yeah, you can really dive in the weeds with that kind of stuff. Ben Shapiro's a libertarian. Yeah, I mean, he says he is. I mean, there's people who call themselves anarchists who are just actually pro-capitalist. They call themselves like ca capitalist anarchists or something like that. Um, 
hence the the names but to me they're not anarchists but once again we're getting into like the this label means this therefore you must think this blah 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 so um but yeah ben Shapiro, yeah ben Shapiro is a he's a conservative but like if you're looking at a political compass libertarians that people think of are on the right side lower right side like liberal libertarian communism i would say is more on the le it's on the lower left side political compass also has its own issues so that's what i kind of trying to mean yeah because if you i think of the political compass like the lower section is considered more libertarian and then the top section is more authoritarian so yeah all that political fun stuff i used to do uh in college i originally was a political science major and then switched to minor because i thought we'd be talking more about theory and stuff and it just turned more into like talking about polling and like looking at data and I'm, i wish i did more of that because I, I could give you more of a better answer <laughs> and i feel like i could have been uh further politically uh quicker you know shouldn't have taken a, a pandemic and bernie sanders losing to get to where my politics is um but whatever <laughs> uh yeah so the last the last one we did was it was almost three hours so i don't know if we're gonna hit three hours again but whatever like i said we're still learning we are uh yeah bernie bro well it was i mean i don't hate bernie sanders or anything but i'm definitely much further left than i was when i when i cared about him yeah <laughs> Or like at least was like wanting him to win. So maybe him, if he won, maybe I, I wouldn't call like I wouldn't be where I am politically. So maybe him losing, you know, who knows? <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm in the classic Bernie to DSA to communist pipeline. <laughs> That's a joke, and uh, from a lot of folks I know who are followed the similar path. Um, all right, let's watch this video here. Um, uh, I just found this today because I had another video that is now private or is gone or deleted. Um, so I don't know what happened, but I found this guy instead. I just Googled like, or uh, Googled, not Googled, but YouTubed Praxis just to see what came up. And this cool video popped up. I watched like the first five minutes and I just thought it was one wholesome because he's filming in like what looks like his backyard and it's a gorgeous fucking backyard. I would never move. Um, <laughs> but, uh, besides that, I feel like he kind of talks about that whole conversation we've been kind of loosely talking about, which is like, what is like, if, if theory is, or if praxis is theory and action, like what's kind of the differences? Why is it sometimes confusing? This is, uh, nine months ago, this video. So it's, it's new. Hello. Welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja. Uh, we have, do we have captions? And today I will share some of my views about theory and praxis. Whoops. Now, Just obviously, I have to say these two words in a linear fashion, which sometimes implicitly implies that theory and praxis are these two separate entities. Am and I right, though, with the, the like, this is gorgeous gorgeous and with all the firewood and stuff you know that they like have some great bonfires <laughs> i grew up in upstate new york so like bonfire is like part of our culture <laughs> up there um and i'm just so jealous of this everything <laughs> and that's how most people also tend to treat them. it looks fun. like some people <laughs> would just say that's theory it's got nothing to do with praxis and vice versa right but, you know, there are two sources where you can go to really understand clearly the loop that constitutes these two terms, which means that they are not necessarily separate, one or the other, but they are constantly interconnected. Well, was that a little corgi or something? One is famously the Deleuze-Foucault interview, oh. Intellectuals in Power. I'm supposed to pay attention, but I thought that dog for sure... <laughs> for sure was gonna go in the water maybe they do intellectuals and power which actually was the interview that Gayatri Spivak was trying to listen to but I'm also getting distracted in by the her dog. essay <laughs> can the subaltern speak 
and I'll post a link to that interview in the description. And there is a moment in that interview where Deleuze basically says, Pomeranian. theory is praxis. Good call, good call. I don't know my dogs. <laughs> it's not separate or something to that effect, that it's not separate from practice or praxis itself. The other more comprehensive resource, of course, in understanding theory and praxis is Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, right? And I have a whole series on it, which you can watch. But what Freire no, famously again, right? asserts at different places in the book is that theory is reflection, thinking about concepts, and praxis is action, right? So praxis without theory is what he calls mere activism. And theory without praxis is what he calls mere intellectualism. Yeah, so I was talking about that earlier. Is like I feel like some parts of the definition of praxis can just be activism. Um, and I kind of go back and forth to whether I like I think they're different. Like I feel like they're kind of the same to a degree because a lot of people who are activists I feel like are doing it for a social or political reason. They're not, you know you know, they're not just doing activism for the sake of because it's a good thing. There's also usually like a social or, or political reason they're doing it, right? Because you can, once again, be like a, a right-wing activist, you know. Um, so he kind of talks about it here. So for Freire, then, a praxis has both in it. It has the theoria, theory, and it has actual actions that we take to change the things, right? So both the concepts are not just interconnected. They depend on each other to define themselves. Now, in terms of literary studies, most of the times, if we think of theory, we think in terms of, oh, this is new criticism, you know, this is structuralism, post-structuralism, and then we think of it as a tool that allows us to open a text. But I think that's a very limited view of theory and its usage. Now, we all live in one or the other theory. We see the world from that perspective, okay? So theory then informs the way we look at the text, what we find important, what we find significant in a given text, and what is it that we privilege over other things in a given text. So let me give you an example. Let's say I'm a post-colonialist, whatever that means these days. So when okay. I pick up a novel, if it is set in India, chances are I'll probably not just focus on the aesthetic aspects of the novel. Because of my training and what I've read, my way of looking at the world has already been somewhat determined by that theory. So what I look in the text is, you know, who is colonized? Who is being a colonizer? What kind of lives do the native people live? How does the colonial experience impact them? Now, all of this way of looking at it, at it is not natural. I'm seeing it because my professional training is to look for that, and theory informs that. Now, we could end it there, but if we talk about praxis, that means that whatever I've learned, whatever I read, for me then must also become a means to do, actually do something in the world. So if I'm writing something, I will try to write in a way where it says something about the world or tries to give an alternative point of view. I might also take that theoretical knowledge and then put it into practice and work with a group who's fighting for their rights or fighting for environment, right? And that's where reflections combines with practice to become praxis. Now, a great example of that would be if you look at... So theory and practice becomes praxis. Um, I just want to say that... Um, they're like doing a great job. I feel like that anything I've said today, <laughs> um, yeah, Dr. Uh, Masood Raja, Raja, I don't, Raja, I don't know how to say it. I think he said at the top how to say it. Um, so apologies if I'm mispronouncing it. Um, yeah, just like talking about, uh, 
the Zapatista movement. Kind of like, is it almost like an algorithm, the role of right? Uh, Marcos in it. Marcos, who was not indigenous, but he goes into the jungle and he brings with his the knowledge of whatever he has read, Foucault, Deleuze, Marx. And the people teach him about their way of life and their struggles. So this intellectual knowledge combined with real activism, real active fighting, then constitutes a kind of politics, a kind of praxis that we call Zapatismo, which goes beyond Mexico, which is being emulated digitally and elsewhere. So I understand in so many ways the way literary theory is taught. It is taught with a very limited function and we internalize that. And we start believing that as humanities scholars or teachers, our job is just to teach the text, right? And I've always found it to be the easier path because that allows me to control the situation. I'm here to teach this novel. And I'm going to use this theory to teach it. My job is not to teach people about justice and equity and love because the novel should be able to do that. If you've watched any of my videos on critical pedagogy, you already know that the books that I've read and my own experience has taught me that novels by themselves don't do that. It involves critical pedagogy. So a better way of using or thinking about theory would be that it's not a tool with which you open a text. As you read more and more theoretically, philosophically, you are defining your own self, you're constructing your own self. That self then sees the world from that philosophical and theoretical perspective. And then that's what you bring to a text and to actual practice in the world. Now, there is a little bit of a cautionary note, and Saeed talks about it in his book, The Word, The Text, and The Critic. And that is about his theorization of affiliation and filiation. And I have a video on that that you can watch. So filiation is sometimes what we get from a family group or a kinship group, right? Kinship group, and that defines our worldview, our politics. Affiliation is what we affiliate ourselves with as adults. Where do we go to school? What do we study? Which group we, we join, right? But what he says is that at a certain point in a scholarly career, the affiliative structures become kind of affiliated. And that means that we stop looking at the world from a different perspective, we just internalize whatever our own theoretical and philosophical grounding is and just constantly keep seeing the world through that. A better way of using theory or thinking the world through theory would be to be eclectic, right? To have your political leanings, you know, you believe in workers' rights, you believe in people's rights, to be fully realized human beings, that's your larger philosophical paradigm. But within that, sometimes you can use Foucault, sometimes you can use Marx, right? But be tolerant of differences. So let me give you an example of how theoretical and philosophical knowledge shapes our consciousness and then also helps us see the world from that perspective. Think of, let's say, if you are uh, an economist. If you have internalized that productivity is the most important thing, you will look at labor and think from the point of view of productivity. If you're a leftist economist, you will look at it from the point of view of how labor is treated and how they are paid. You're using economic theory, but you're looking at the world differently, and it will allow you to draw different conclusions. That's it. I hope this was useful to you. Let me know what you Interesting. think, and I will now talk to you next time. Until uh, very well spoken. I wish I could speak like that. like I'm. Trust me, like every time I do these kind of streams, I overthink everything I'm saying, <laughs> and that's why I freaking always feel like I have to correct myself or miss say something. I wish I could speak like this. <laughs> just so well thought out, and uh, and just like they just one take this, one take it. Amazing.
Uh, but yeah, here's the video. If you want to watch it again or subscribe or whatnot. I think I might subscribe afterwards. Um, and then, uh, so that was more of like the theory stuff again. Um, but there, there was this video that I had, I watched a while back when I was first thinking of doing this uh, series here. Um, once again, uh, having some sort of values and uh, acting on them, trying to make a world a better place. Um, yeah, this is a uh, London in a London anarchist group squatting mansions to fight homelessness. Um, actually, I'm going to stop the music. I feel like it's a little distracting in the background. So let's watch videos at this point. If we see a big building that looks expensive and it's empty, we take it. Hold on, let me see if I get English subtitles. I don't know why it's in Czech. English is fine. All right, let's start over. Okay, this is like just super, super praxis for sure. If we see a big building that looks expensive and it's empty, we take it. Uh, in 2016, there were 4,134 rough sleepers in the UK, uh, up by 16% from 2015. Currently, there are over 200,000 buildings that have been empty for longer than six months. Uh, in the United States, I don't have the exact numbers, obviously, in front of me, but there's enough housing to house everybody in America. Uh, a lot of people who uh, uh, are trying to, you know, and nothing against them because they're, you know, on the same side of trying to fight uh, uh, to, you know, give housing uh, to people who are, are homeless. Um, there's always like this argument that we need to build more, we need to build affordable housing, all that stuff. It's like, that we have housing to like already house people? We just refuse to do that either because they're not affordable or there's, you know, other things going on. But like I know in Denver, we have so much housing here, but it's so fucking expensive. Welcome to our lovely uh, 17 million pound abode. I guess there is already subtitles. So maybe we're good. Oh, this is <laughs> this was funny. Uh, London-based activist Anal, <laughs> the autonomous nation of anarchist libertarians, are famous for squat, uh, squatting empty high-end properties. Once inside, they open them up to the homeless. Uh, Freaking amazing acronym, just classic troll. <laughs> classic troll move. So you're here for the grand tour, yes? This is our uh, screening room. We're gonna have a nice projector up here, do some nice films, documentaries. In the meantime, we might be through that TV, who knows? We've got a fire alarm, which uh, you know everybody knows to ring when the bailiffs or the police arrive or whatnot. We've opened a good 30, 40 buildings in the past. When you like, first open it, it's got like, the adrenaline rush. Especially when you've been like scouting out a building for ages, a really nice one that you've been wanting. And then you find an entry point, like boom, like yeah, it's beautiful. We've been eyeing this building out for a while and Obviously, we got evicted from the other one, and we came straight over to this place and got in within a matter of minutes. You could probably fit about 100 people in here easily, right. like safely as well. These are like the penthouse suites for the exclusive members of Anal. What is Anal? <laughs> well, I mean, it stands for the Autonomous Nation of Anarchist Libertarians. And we think it's just like a really joke symbolism of how we're taking the piss out of the system, basically. Again, such massive, massive rooms with uh, chandeliers, and we've got lovely views from outside. After the fascist attack in uh, Belgravia, we want them to know we're here, you know? Come back again. We were having workshops on the day, we've got children and families around, and the next thing you know, we've got people screaming that there's somebody trying to break into the building. So we presumed it was private security, like the owner trying to get us out illegally. And then just windows started smashing. Then we learned after looking outside, you know, they had fascist masks on and they were pointing fascist salutes. <laughs> Leftists are just memers of standards and ethics. <laughs> yeah, when you think about it, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we, we know how to meme. That's for sure. We knew then it was fascist. Then at that moment, we're like, right, well then, let's fight back. So we yeah, grab fire extinguishers. <laughs> None of us got injured though. Definitely, as a squad, I've seen there's a lot more squads popping up. They say that you know most working class people are just two paychecks away from being homeless. It's the housing crisis, isn't it? Society as it is nowadays is. Yeah, two paycheck. I mean, probably even less than that in America um, right now. I mean, I'm very lucky to like be able to like. I always at least have like three months of rent. That's always like my, my goal. Uh, 
like my parents, uh, when I was living, you know, when I was younger, our family, we lived like paycheck to paycheck. Maybe we get like some extra money because my dad would do overtime or something. Um, you know, and, uh, maybe we go on vacation every couple years. So like, we're still like a lot better than a lot of other people, but, um, yeah, it's like, I feel like there's a lot of people I know who, you know, can't do like the more, you know, go to the movies or like go out to eat once in a while because, you know, or worried about losing housing constantly, you know, living paycheck to paycheck. When I first moved to Baltimore, uh, I worked for like $12 an hour. And then my partner, she was working for like, I think, yeah, maybe 11, $10 an hour. And it, I think two thirds of our, our paycheck collectively just went to housing. You know what I mean? Like it's crazy generating more and more homeless and more poverty so is it morally acceptable to have buildings like this empty while people are dying on the streets who needn't be you know Actually, i'm lost here where am i going um oh not through here <laughs> i get lost on the board of myself there's a room of <laughs> just a, a bucket of keys there <laughs> or whatever that was when it comes to central to be fair uh, yeah, it's fucked my mom wants to get a house for us, but it's too damn expensive. Yeah, I mean, like, I make decent money now for my age, and I'm blessed and lucky to have that. Um, but even then, like, I still am like, I don't know, what, like, I have a savings account, and I'm like, I have to, like, <laughs> I did the math. I'm like, I gotta save for, like, 10 more years to even, like, put a down payment on, like, even, like, the shittiest of houses in Colorado here. Like, it's crazy. And I get YouTube ads sometimes of, like, houses uh you know like and they'll be like look it'll look decent and then it'll be like five hundred thousand dollars i'm like what five hundred thousand dollars and it's not even in like a neighborhood that's like you know like it's just a regular suburban neighborhood i'm like five hundred thousand dollars crazy i'm like if i'm gonna if i'm paying five hundred thousand dollars for a house i better be living in the mountains you know uh, there is Come no on! Like anal. I've got to be proud to say that you know anal do penetrate deep into the heart of London. Yeah, <laughs> anal penetrate deep. About four years ago, or so I left home and eventually get the money. Yeah, I'm, I've just I've already like at this point, like if we're getting a house, it's not going to be in this state. Like it's going to be like in Kansas or something boring. <laughs> no offense to Kansas, um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Just like. I don't get it, but, or yeah, there's some places we probably could get a house in, but then like the jobs that I know I can do don't exist there. So yeah, it's, it sucks. There's just not a win-win anywhere so or London, not a place to, you know, to, like, introduce to have squats. success. I think, you know, the more squats you go to, the more squats you help open eventually, you know, you become an expert then. Damn it, page 15 and we're not good enough. Yeah. So uh, squat is I up 17 mil home as a community hub. And uh, again, it's speaking about how the owner is like a Qatari and ex-general. Um, Anal have been squatting buildings like this for about three years or so. And the uh, criteria is just any building which looks obviously empty and not used, but also with some degree of wealth. Like, you know, if, if it's a building... With I live in Washington uh, State there. Uh, most houses are ranged from 400K to 10 million. Psh, yeah, I believe it. Which will get me... West Coast ain't cheap. Your attention if Maybe like the... I'll say the pay is better like here than... Because I've lived on mostly East Coast my entire life. And... The pay is better here, but the caveat is everything else is expensive. So it's like some things are cheaper on these coasts, but then you're only making, you know, 45K a year. So it's a building which we think has a greater use, then we take it. We think of homeless being people who just sleep on the streets, but there's lots of youth nowadays, especially, who don't have a home to go to. They just have friends' sofas, but they're still homeless. Even if they have a sofa to sleep on, they're still homeless. Yeah. just don't see it, you know. And every day you see a different room, every day I found a different cover. Uh, let me just read this. Uh, thanks to Anil Grant, who has been homeless since 2015, has been able to get off the streets and spend the night somewhere safe and dry. Frickin' Praxis. Hell yeah. Uh, back in This is a workplace. It's no a family home. You know what I mean? But it could be. It could be. It could be, mate. But you know, it's just wrong, man. 
Again, we're all one big family. We're, we're the biggest family ever. And many of us are dying in a year of the cold and having nothing to do and taking drugs and being stuck with nobody. What's my trade in my knowledge? My trade in my knowledge is homeless, mental health, and the alcohol and the drugs issues. Yeah. I can help the type of people in an environment like this. Jesus, you can see we're helping people you now. Some people are getting happier. There's people coming off the streets, they're getting cleaner, they're getting everything they need, and they're getting fed. That's what they're in us today. You know, my aim with me. If you look at the streets, right there, you know, like, now uh, they have values. Um, you know, they have, they're like, you know, I want to help people like me and like, you know, at least give them a place to eat and, uh, eat, sleep and just be happier, you know? And he's even using his lived experience to help other people. Um, just freaking amazing. Was six years ago, there were so many homeless now. The problem is getting so much worse. There is hundreds, if not thousands of buildings just like this one within Central or within the yeah, twenty thirty dollars an hour is not enough to live here. Yeah, I mean, then people have roommates too. Like, like my partner and I, you know, we we split things, right? You know, uh, I don't know if I like. I would maybe I could live by myself, but I wouldn't be able to do. We we get to you know go to the movies and stuff. I wouldn't be able to do any of that stuff, or maybe not be able to you know, you know like five, have time for anything else. That would just be working. Things, just like so that's the thing is like I'm once again really lucky and privileged, but there's a lot of people I know who are live by themselves but still make you know 20 30 dollars an hour but they're you know struggling or they're living at their parents still like this one or they you know because they have to uh yeah that's really cool this is six years ago so i hope they're still i don't know if they're still kicking but i hope so especially uh you know during uh covid and whatnot uh, so yeah, that's a really cool video. Just wanted to show like praxis, you know, really, really, I mean, action is part of the praxis definition, but you know what I mean? Praxis in action, uh, you know, just in a day by day basis, you know, that's huge respect to them. Uh, and then we have this video here, um, by second thought who we watched last time talk about like what is socialism and, uh, this video I hope is just as informative. Uh, they always do a good job. So we need a wealth redistribution. Can't read today. This is why we need wealth redistribution. If anything, if everyone can afford a house, then maybe more people will be willing to contribute to a better society. Yeah, but I mean, I think the system is never gonna. Or, the uh, capitalism works because, or works at least for the you know the rich and whatnot. Um, you know, right? Like, yeah, at the very least, I know what you're saying. Like, I agree, right? <laughs> uh, you know, it's like. At the end of the day, though, like capitalism works because there's so many people living paycheck to paycheck. If everyone had everything they needed, you know, they would stop sh potentially maybe co going to crappy jobs and feeding the machine. Um, you know, yeah, it's just uh, it's crazy. Um, oh yeah, let me link this video if folks want to watch it again or send it to their. Family and friends. Yes, yeah, so this video is second thought um, from two years ago. Um, they talk about uh, you know ways to uh, do kind of like mutual aid one on one. Um, do you have a Discord? Uh, yes, it's a small community, but we mostly talk about Counter Strike on there. But um, maybe at some point I'll add a politics channel. Um, most people in my discord are generally left leaning. So and no one's never been mean or anything. Um, but, uh, yeah, pretty chill in there. Uh, but yeah, this video here, um, talking about mostly about, uh, obviously mutual aid, but I think we're talking about before, like one way of doing praxis is like setting up mutual aid networks. And I just thought this would be a cool video. Um, uh, I know it's one thing I've, I suck at, I'm not very good at like, I feel like I, I should be more involved with things, especially since once again, I maybe have the financial situation to do so at least try to, I try to donate money a lot to mutual aid networks at the very least. Um, but, uh, maybe this will be helpful for maybe if you, if, you know, maybe in your community, if there's something that you think that 
a mutual aid uh, group can make, you know, <laughs> like these people, they're, they're, you know, they're squatting and finding ways to house homeless. Um, but yeah, this video I think will be just informative of like mutual aid and whatnot. And maybe it'll kind of tie into future um, subjects that we're going to do. This episode was made in collaboration with... Actually, let me once again close captions. This episode was made in collaboration with Reeducation. If you'd like to learn more about the specifics of mutual aid, be sure to check out their video after this. I feel like this is like 720p. What's going on? There we go. It said auto 1080p, but it did not look We good. live <laughs> in troubling times. The most powerful nation on earth is on a collision course with complete economic collapse. We hop from crisis to crisis every few years, and each time millions of Americans lose their jobs, their homes, their health care, and their livelihoods. Meanwhile, the rich continue to capitalize on the suffering of the many. In the aftermath of the 2008 housing crisis, real estate companies and wealthy individuals snapped up countless homes of the recently evicted, and to this day, they rent them out at more and more ridiculous. Yeah, the freaking housing. I mean, I 2007, 2008 was when I started to get old enough to kind of like. I wasn't like I would say politically like you know uh, 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 you know too involved or anything like that. But I started like watching the news more and. Uh, you know, at that point, I was kind of starting to become libbed up a little bit, uh, you know, with like Obama and whatnot, you know, running and whatnot. But um, but yeah, I I hope to do an episode on like either Occupy Wall Street or just like 2007, just like the year, because I feel like a lot of important shit happened then. Um, yeah, and I was just I was just young enough to like at least uh, not fully understand everything or at least be able to pay attention the way, you know, I could have. But I do remember enough of it where it just felt like an important rates. time. More than a third of the entire U.S. workforce is held captive by the gig economy, making on average 58% less than other workers and receiving Crazy. no job security, health care, or benefits. Quality of life is going down. Job satisfaction is going down. Rates of depression are way up. Life expectancy is on the decline. And in a country with seemingly endless resources for wars, tax cuts for the rich, and industry bailouts, we have over half a million Americans without so much as a roof over their head, and tens of millions more on the brink of joining them. We are ramping up our military posturing against countries like Iran and China, one to justify the endless and lucrative- Uh, Ukraine. ...lucrative war in the Middle East, and the other to try to maintain- Now, you know, now it's Ukraine. ...maintain global economic <laughs> domination, a position which is rapid- Because didn't they sign a bill like a couple of months ago that was like- something billion slipping away in no small part due to our own eagerness to outsource jobs for ever greater profits to top things off electoral politics are more polarized than ever the republicans adopting alarmingly conspiratorial language and hateful rhetoric and the democrats as usual failing to deliver any real meaningful reform choosing instead to means test incredibly popular policies into oblivion Unsurprisingly, public approval of Congress hovers around an abysmal 25%, with most people asserting that those who represent us are nothing more than out-of-touch, corrupt people with no interest in actually improving anything. It's no surprise that more and more people are looking for ways to affect change on their own. They see that the system is leaving the vast majority of people to suffer, and they understand that there has to be a better way. One of the most common questions I get on my channel is, what can I do? How can I help? I'm fully aware... I think I completely skipped the libbed up phase. I'm trying to unlearn all the implicit shit and went leftist pure and true. Yeah, I like, I think it's just because like my parents weren't really like political. Like we didn't really talk politics growing up. Not not because it wasn't allowed. It was just more of like, I don't think my parents cared. You know what I mean? Like as long as, you know, like, I mean, I don't, my parents never like criticized George Bush, right? You know, I know my parents voted for Obama. Uh, at least the first time, you know, um, you know, they're, uh, they, uh, very patriotic though, I guess was the one thing. I think that's what made me kind of, I guess, more, I say libbed up because a lot of my family members even to this day are still, uh, you know, in the military and whatnot. Um, but when I was in college, I kind of was like the, the, like the liberal, like I like believed in like, you know, human rights, right. Or like, but what, my politics were really just like, like if you asked me like about Black Lives Matter for the the same, or for around the if you haven't asked me about Black Lives Matter in like 2015, right? Like I would have been like, oh, I I generally agree, but like I don't think they should, you know, I I would say stuff like we shouldn't be violent or, uh, you know, 
just a classic white person thing of saying like there's right ways to protest kind of thing um or i just didn't care like i didn't even know about bernie sanders at all in 2015 like i didn't even, i never even paid attention uh and then like i voted i think i was in new york i voted green because i was like whatever yeah because everyone said you know hillary was gonna win you know and after that you know like i was on like the oh trump won't be that bad crowd you know what i mean like i was i was probably the worst person in college <laughs> but it was like my last couple years in college i started taking like different classes i started like hanging out with diff some different people uh you know and then i moved to baltimore after college and i think that like changed my worldview a little bit uh I, I did go abroad when i was in college as well i think that helped um but then yeah like 2018 2019 i started like really getting more into politics um and like you know kind of getting on the bernie sanders campaign and then yeah now i'm here so <laughs> that channels like mine tend to highlight the problems we face without offering many real concrete solutions so in this episode we're going to talk about one simple way for the average person to improve the lives of others build stronger communities and work towards an eventual alternative to the decaying economic so yeah, under working for a better world we all operate today in my last video we talked about the counterproductiveness of hyper individualism this worldview the idea that everyone should pull themselves up by their bootstraps only look out for themselves and see everyone else as competition is incredibly unhealthy both on a personal level and in regards to building strong communities and a happy healthy society in a perverse yeah it's like talking about that briefly like it's, I still have this ingrained in me. Like, it's crazy how much, like, our education system, media, and everything else, it, COVID, like, created, uh, just, like, it's still in the back of my head of, like, I struggle so much of when, like, because I just, you know, I don't want to be selfish, but, like, our world is so pushed towards being selfish that I'm, like, I'm always, like, I feel like, you know, I either contradict myself or it's like constantly battling myself internally. Uh, <laughs> fuck it. I hate it. I hate it so much. Just every time I like hear about it, I just like, yep, yep, yep. That's fucking me. You know, going back to like, I, you know, I have, I am able to afford ni some nice things once in a while. And like, there's people who don't. And I'm like, I feel like shit that I can't give them money, but maybe I can give them money. Maybe I don't give enough, you know, like all that stuff that just starts going in your head. But then it's like, do I have enough, you don't have enough to change the world, you know, and all that stuff, so. First bit of irony, the U.S., a nation that likes to tout its strong Christian foundation, has adopted a vision of social Darwinism that is completely detached from reality. We hear the term survival of the fit. Yeah, DeSantis is fascist. Fuck. <laughs> a lot. Fuck especially in regards to the market. Only the hardest. And the internalized bigotry, yeah. <laughs> Just like constant, like. You know, just workers will succeed. Then you start overthinking shit just constantly. Indeed, and like I said, I it, this sh this thing that I'm doing right now probably would happen more often if I was more confident. <laughs> Everyone else, <laughs> it just is so internalized. Due to a supposed <laughs> lack of morality or strength of will. But then people always tell me, like privately, like friends and family, like why don't you do more of that? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> well, of course, this vision of survival of the fittest is not representative of how it works in real life. In the animal kingdom, including humans up until very recently, unity and solidarity with other members of your species was the only way to ensure survival. Not of the individual animal, but of the species as a whole. Survival was a team effort, each doing their part for the strength and betterment of the group. It's only since the development of global capitalism that we humans have decided to treat each other as enemies to be defeated rather than brothers and sisters. If we follow hyper-individual- I, I kind of disagree with that because I feel like feudalism was- <laughs> was also pretty like i mean it's part of hierarchies right like that's the issue with the hierarchies is that like they create this conflict that like it's you against your neighbor you against uh you know sometimes you get you know you against your own family members and shit you know what i mean just thinking to it's not saying that conflict is you know if we got rid of hierarchies there'd be no conflict but you know what i mean where it's just logical like logical conclusion capitalism yes creates much more uh selfish and selfishness and and conflicts and only looking out for yourself you know it's not that sense of community um but i don't think that like before capitalism it was that much better either because feudalism <laughs> feudalism was awful too and we get a very dire image of the world to come living under like probably the roman empire probably fucking sucked if you were <laughs> a random peasant 
take the recent winter storms and t- wish people were more open about having internalized problems. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and that's why at the top of this thing, like I was trying to say that, like, I might say something that you know, maybe I'm not 100 percent correct. Maybe this whole time I've been wrong, but I'm like, you know, it's at least if we're all trying and like, you know, uh, trying to be better and trying to learn things and you know, push in the right direction. You know, we gotta hold each other accountable. Don't get me wrong, but you know what I mean. That it's like good faith. You know, I think people. I think part of the reason we don't like share our internalized problems is because we judge each other so much. You know, I fucking do it all the time. Like I'm awful at my, like I don't, I can't even, I'm trying to preach it, but I don't even practice it myself all the time. My brain is quick to judge people very quick, (laughs) very quickly. Texas. I live in the DFW. And I also judge myself so much that I think, you know, I expect the same thing from, uh, uh, you know, others. Right area. When the snow rolled in and people started losing power, what happened? Texans rushed to the grocery stores and picked them clean, buying more perishable goods than they could possibly use. They flocked to Lowe's and Home Depot and bought up every single space heater they could fit in their trucks, leaving their fellow Texans, myself included, to struggle with frozen pipes and power outages. Hotels jacked up their prices tenfold, pricing freezing people Awful. out of basic safety. Everyone looked out only for themselves, with no regard for others who also have needs. If the people who absconded with 40 dozen eggs had just taken a moment to think about their neighbors, there would be plenty for everyone. Instead, a few people took far more than they needed and that food, food that could have fed countless families, will spoil before they can use it. This is the problem in a nutshell. Yeah, people were buying like freaking A fierce- Like- Anything you buy dairy is going to go bad. So, like, <laughs> it's just... Dedication what to are the you survival doing? of the individual. Even the meat, unless you have, like, a big freaking freezer. Like, what are you doing? Jewel, to the detriment of the survival of the group. There is a better way. In his work, Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution, Kropotkin writes... I need to read more. I, I've only read segments of his stuff. In the long run, the practice of solidarity proves much more advantageous to the species. Oh, another good mutual aid book, though, is uh, Dean Spade. Mutual aid. I read that. It's short. It's like 100 pages, and it's really, really good. Then the development of... I think you can get online, or uh, you can buy it somewhere for like... I think I got it for like 10 bucks or something. Jewels endowed with predatory inclinations. This should be common sense. If you have a pride of lions, and one of them is the best hunter, capable of securing enough food for the whole pride... Which would be more beneficial to the survival of the group? That lion hoarding their food and allowing the others to go hungry? Or sharing their food because there's plenty to go around? A starving lion is no good to the pride. It will be weak and helpless. A lion with enough to eat can contribute. Now imagine a vastly more intelligent species, with the capacity to produce huge quantities of food on demand, with networks of highways, railways, shipping lanes, and giant metal contraptions that can fly supplies anywhere in the world. That species has all the tools for every member of the species to flourish. Of course, we also have a desire for profit. The profit motive is the roadblock that prevents the hungry from getting enough to eat, the homeless from getting a roof over their head, the sick from getting the treatment they need. Every day, grocery stores throw out literal tons of perfectly good food. Oh my gosh, yes. You know how much freaking grocery stores throw out? It's, I don't know, if you've worked in a grocery store, you know. It's crazy how much they throw out. Like, I worked in, like, so I, I, I grew up in a small town of, like, population of, like, probably 3,000, right? Maybe less. Uh, we had one grocery store in the town. One. Okay? And it was part of, like, a chain, but whatever. It's one one grocery store. And, you know, they had four registers. So it's a small, you know, I mean, small, small store. Four registers, you know, there was maybe, like, seven aisles. Uh... And especially the dairy department, dude, they threw away so much shit, so much. Like we would, we, they always had like to have the, like the, the yogurt section completely stacked, but they would throw anything away as soon as it expired. Boom. Or even if it was like a day before, boom. Sometimes they would put it on sale for like 25 cents or something, but it's just like, but it would always be like. Seven, like you'd be like 70 at a time that would just be thrown away it felt like every day you know it, it's it's freaking just sad you know and then that, that that's just yogurt dude like that <laughs> there's so much 
that they threw it like donuts there they would always get i i since i got paid 725 an hour uh what i would do is i'd wait for the donuts to almost expire and then we always put them on sale for like a dollar and that's when i would <laughs> go and buy uh donuts for lunch um it, yeah it was just i don't know just it makes me that, that makes me the most mad it's just like i worked in a small little grocery store for a small town and then there's like the big grocery stores, you know, that supply like, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and they're still throwing away food. <laughs> yeah. Well, because the reason there's so much of it, they it's easier for the companies to mass produce it than and that's what keeps it, you know, they, they can make it cheaper that way too, right? Um, they mass produce it and they don't give a fuck if it's thrown away. from getting enough to eat they don't the homeless fuck. from getting a roof over their head the sick it's like the funko pop thing the there was a, a report that came out that funko pop was throwing away like all their shit that what didn't sell and people were getting mad at them right and it's like okay you're mad about that food companies do the same shit restaurants do the same shit do you think who do you think eats the food if you don't if you go to a restaurant and you finish like half the plate and you don't take it home who do you think eats it oh it doesn't it gets thrown away from getting the treatment they need. Every if, oh, if they messed up my order, I don't want it anymore, they throw it away. Every day, grocery stores throw out literal tons of perfectly good food, food which could be distributed to those in need. Recently, a young person working at a donut shop was fired for handing out to homeless people and firefighters the donuts that were slated to be thrown away. During the recent winter storm, police were stationed at dumpsters to prevent desperate people from getting some much needed food. Here's the problem. The profit motive, the thing which makes all of these heinous practices inevitable, is not going away anytime soon. We cannot count on grocery stores or their wealthy owners to consider the good of the group. That's where the practices of direct action and mutual aid come in. Let's take a moment to define those terms. Direct action is exactly- Yeah, like this shit just makes me so mad, you know, like, ah. Uh, what it sounds- Like, I, one, I think, the one mutual aid I've, wa I've wanted to get into is like, like I, if- if I had a house, going back to housing, uh, if I had a house, like I would 100% like would make like a big fridge, community fridge or something that either a like people could come and take from, or like, uh, or I could drive it somewhere and drop it off, like, because a lot of people, like so food not bombs is a good organization um, that does like the, like what they do. I know a lot of times is they work with like uh, restaurants and stuff, and they'll like they'll take the excess food. And then use it to give it to homeless and whatnot. Or they'll go to grocery stores. Or they dumpster dive. Because um, so much food, like I said, so much food is thrown away. Um, but yeah, a lot of mutual aid groups that Doing feed homeless directly. like work with, either work with or, you know, under the table. ...with the explicit purpose of improving the material conditions of those around you. This often includes going on strike or staging sit-ins or protests. Things to bring attention to a problem. When used in relationship to mutual aid, the act of helping others and building strong interpersonal connections, direct action could mean establishing a community fridge or free store, a place where people who need help could about. come and take the food they need. It could mean finding places for people to stay when their power goes... How about we just all start stealing from grocery stores? Uh, they can't arrest millions of people. Well, obviously, I would never say you should do a crime, okay? <laughs> but I will say if I... The rule I've heard thrown around is if you see some if you see someone shoplifting, no, you didn't. That's all I'll say. <laughs> it was out during a winter storm. At its core, mutual aid is the practice of helping others. I mean, there's those groups of people who, uh, uh, <laughs> um, there's like those groups of people who, um, I don't know if they like. I don't know. I think it was in L.A. There was like hundreds of people would run into like a target and just grab as much shit and they would all run. And it was basically that method. Like they can't arrest everybody, you know, loot mass looting others in any way you can fully cognizant of the fact that one day you may need help and that hopefully the community you helped build will be there to help you. There's an old Reddit thread that sums up the philosophy pretty well. You've probably heard the phrase today, you tomorrow me. I'll link the thread below, but the gist is this. A man breaks down on the side of the road, his tire blown. He's there for hours, watching countless people and tow truck drivers go by, despite trying to wave them down for help. 
Eventually, a poor Mexican family pulls over, the husband helps fix the flat, and his reasoning was, today you, tomorrow me. This kind soul understood that this could have happened to anyone, including himself, and that he would have needed help in that situation. The user who posted this story said that he now goes out of his way to help others, and always tells them, today you, tomorrow me. That's what mutual aid is all about, building a community of people willing to help each other. The act of fixing a flat tire is a pretty good summation of the goal of direct action as well. Someone has a material concern, a broken down car, and the solution is for someone who is able to fix it. Politicians are notorious for completely ignoring the material concerns of those they're meant to serve. The one recent instance of government direct action was the original COVID stimulus checks. People <laughs> right. were out of work, so they weren't being paid. They needed money for bills and food. The obvious solution was to give them money, no strings attached, no means testing. The outcome is exactly what you'd expect. People spent the money on food and bills. It allowed them to eat, to pay for their medication, and to put off eviction, at least for a little while. Obviously, these one- It was also a way to fuel the economy. You know, because the economy was in dog shit. So they're like, we need people to spend money. We need people to spend money. Because here's the thing with COVID, right? You know, people are still dying from COVID every day. But they got to a point. You know, the, the our economy, our society got to a point, you know, where we're like, we're okay with X number of people dying. You know. We 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 got to this point where you know like we're like hey this number is good we can deal with this because they were the reason like we shut down wasn't because of uh you know of our public health and safety it was because they didn't want all the workers to die think about it that way you know it wasn't because the government was feeling nice okay <laughs> I don't think it was because if everyone just kept going to work like normal. Millions and millions and millions and millions would have died. We had millions die with the, quote, well, half lockdown that we really, we didn't really do a full lockdown in the United States. Let's be real. How many people still had to go to work and, and whatnot. But I'm saying, like, if the people with, like, white collar jobs and whatnot, uh, I don't know. I just, for me, for me, it's just, like, that's when I started becoming more anti-government. <laughs> you know, like, was was COVID. was, like, no, the reason they're giving us money, the reason that... Uh, they did lockdowns. It wasn't because for our public safety. It's because they realized all the workers who do make the products, do everything, would all die or get sick that no one would be able to do the work anymore. Then the bosses would have to get off their asses and do something. <laughs> so, yeah. And there's a reason why they only did like $2,000. That's not enough. Checks were woefully insufficient and most other developed countries handled the crisis vastly better. But this one data point should be enough to make it clear. If people need something, the best solution is to simply provide it. Those tiny checks, while not even enough to cover rent in many places, nonetheless had a huge impact on helping average Americans weather the crisis. Of course, if the past year's worth of crises are anything to go by, we cannot expect the government to provide relief for the people. So we need to do it ourselves. Now, at this point, we need to make... Yeah, the only time the government steps in to help people is when it hurts their bottom line, which is the people giving them money, you know, lobbyists and whatnot. The distinction between charity and... I mean, shit. You know, when, you know when the government stepped in? Was when the railroad uh, workers were going to go on strike and shut down basically the economy. Uh, Joe Biden famously said, you know, he's the most pro-union, pro-worker president. What did he do? Oh, he signed a law to make it so if they went on strike, it'd be illegal. Jewel aid. Weird how they stepped up for that and they did that real when quick. When many people hear about programs to provide for the needy, they automatically think of it as Weird. charity. This is not always the case. Yeah, capitalism needs to go. There are very important differences between Gotta charity go. and solidarity. To start, charity works within the capitalist system and does not make any attempt Yeah, don't donate to charity. To encourage donate to mutual aid. <laughs> structural changes. <laughs> For it's real. often done by the obscenely wealthy or large corporations as a way to launder their image. People like Jeff Bezos amass huge fortunes through exploitation and then donate a tiny sliver of it, often to their own shell companies, as a bit of good PR. When you see a headline about Jeff Bezos donating $10 million to some new initiative, keep in mind what that represents as a percentage of his wealth. $10 million, more than most people could make in 10 lifetimes, is one half of 1% of Bezos' wealth. Of course, $10 million could do a lot of good if it actually went to effective groups or causes. 
The problem is, it usually doesn't, and the person making the donation gets to write it off on their taxes, which Jeff Bezos doesn't seem to pay anyway. Charity is all too often a scam, designed only to keep the pocket change, not even. <laughs> it's like a penny, not even. It's like, it's like a quarter of a penny people content with their wealthy <laughs> overlords. Mutual aid, helping those around you out of a sense of solidarity, is different. The goal is similar to what charity claims to be about, that is, providing the needy with the things they need, but it goes beyond that. With char A lot of charities, too, usually have rules in place of who can uh, get the services they provide. That's the other thing. Uh, you know, there's, there is charities that help with, like, uh, homelessness and whatnot, right? And a lot of times those charities, even if they mean well, what they wind up doing is being like, they start making a rule of who is actually homeless, right? Or who actually needs this food? You know, a lot of mutual aids don't give a fuck. They don't ask, no questions asked. You need food? We got it, right? Because we don't, you don't know their situation. Yeah, maybe they do have money, but maybe they don't have money for food. Maybe they do have a house. Does it mean that their kids might not be starving? Right? But a lot of charities, what they'll do is be like, no, you have a house, so like we're not going to give you any food. This is for people who are in this specific situation. You know? Or they, they can only do a certain amount because, you know, they're, they're, they have donors that they need to, you know, Charity, work with. The aid normally comes with arbitrary and restrictive red tape. You have to be from a certain area, or in a certain demographic, or right here. What was I just saying? You have to be employed, <laughs> or sober, or profess a certain faith, or any number of other lines of fine print. Mutual aid does away with all that. If someone is hungry, feed them. If they need a warm place to weather the storm, give them shelter. No pointless regulations, no strings attached, just basic human decency and a desire to strengthen the community. This is where we get to the important part. Mutual aid seeks to build an alternative to the current system fortifying the community to weather the slow implosion of capitalism. Is the Trevor Project a mutual aid program? I'm not sure. I think they might By be a charity. But to be fair, I, I, the Trevor Project does do good things. I'm not saying all charities, but a lot of charities. Either like are, have too many restrictions or they, you know, they have demographic, demographics that they're aiming for. Um, I just say, like, if you have money to donate, I would donate to a mutual aid first is what I'm really trying to say. Not saying all charities are bad, you know, but you know what I mean. That it's like charities are a lot, a lot of them, especially the bigger ones, are specific in how they uh, either use their donations or whatnot of who they're targeting. Helping your neighbors when they're in need I'm and not sure about others project. to do the same, we can build a network of people willing to work together to break their dependence on aid from elected officials who have made it abundantly clear that they don't care about us. This is called building dual power. Establishing a. We're gonna do an episode on dual power. Dual, dual power. I don't know if we're. Gonna, I have kind of mocked it up already. I don't know if we're gonna do it as the next one because I feel like we need to build up to that. Um. But yeah, dual power is cool. Stable alternative to a floundering state. Handing out sandwiches is only one part of mutual aid and building dual power. Others include providing free medical assistance, communal housing, tenants unions, community defense networks, workers unions, and countless other grassroots structures to inoculate our communities from crisis or coercion. Take the winter storm fallout in Texas. The power grid completely failed. Water treatment facilities went offline, leaving one in 50 Americans without clean drinking water. Grocery stores were picked clean. Hotels jacked up their prices to $1,000 a night while people slept in their cars to try to keep from freezing to death. There was no aid from the state or federal government. In fact, Ted Cruz decided it was a good time to take a little vacation in Cancun, during the worst energy crisis in the state's history. If Texas had strong mutual aid networks, we wouldn't have had to witness mile-long grocery store lines, or people freezing to death in their own homes. We could have organized safe places to sleep. Freaking for pipes freezing and stuff. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, because if the water, yeah, if the water turns off, there's any water in those pipes and they freeze. For those without power, Fuck. we could have distributed food for those who couldn't get any. We could have helped thaw frozen pipes for our neighbors. Building dual power means working together with your fellow human beings and being prepared to handle crises. There's food, when not bombs. When people work there. together, there's very a bunch little of we can't accomplish. It just takes a reconfiguring of our individualist mindset. We're all in this together. Well, you know, except wealthy politicians and oligarchs who can fly somewhere warm the moment they're even slightly uncomfortable. Mutual aid is absolutely essential for building a viable alternative to capitalism. 
Many economists, even some capitalist economists, have long expressed concern that the system is crumbling, that it has cannibalized itself to the point of no return. Whether the collapse will be swift and cataclysmic or slow and painful, the only way we can ensure the safety of our fellow human beings is to build dual power, establish strong mutual aid networks, and realize that we're better together. If you're interested in getting involved in some weather crisis mutual aid efforts in Texas, I've left a link in the description below. To learn more about the specifics of getting started with mutual aid, I highly recommend you check out Reeducation's video next. This episode wouldn't have been possible without him, and his channel is a great resource for those looking to get involved and work towards building dual power. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous episodes by clicking the links on your screen. Yeah, so uh, second thought, once again, breaking it down uh, in a very well thought out way, uh, really easily digestible. Um, but yeah, I mean, like mutual aid is a way of doing praxis, right? Um, I don't think I probably should have saved this video for if we did a mutual aid episode. Um, uh, maybe, maybe we'll revisit it or find a different one. Um, but yeah, I mean... That's, you know, that's praxis is trying to, you know, build a better world with it, whatever way we can, you know. Um, and I know sometimes people aren't able to do mutual aid for whatever reason, but it's like, like I said, it could even, you know, even just doing the small things, you know, like talking to your family members, talking to your friends, you know, just, you know, how do we, what are some things that we can do? Trying to find, maybe there is something that, you know, that's no one's thought of before that we can do, right? Yeah, volunteering, whatever it is, you know, like, uh, you know, there, there's, there's things out there, and we need to find ways to, you know, get there. So, um, but yeah, like, like I said, it's like you can, it's being anti-racist, you know, anti-sexist, you know, being an ally, all those things, right? Being an anti-capitalist, you know, it talk, it's about like being, you know, praxis is action, you know, it's doing those values that we care about and putting them into action. And one, one of those big actions is doing mutual aid for a lot of people, um, you know. So, like I said, I, every time I, I've watched this video, I think two or three times now. Uh, and, yeah, it just makes me more motivated uh, to, like, want to do things, you know. Something I'm trying to work on is, uh, you know, I've been getting more into the theory, getting more into the reading about, you know, uh, communism, whatever, whatever leftist thing, right? And... You know, I think it's good to, you know, be informed and know things, but it's also important to, like, actually put those into action. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, it goes being praxis, like I said, is an action of trying to build to a better world. You want the world to be anti-racist, right? You know, anti-bigoted, right? So, like, we need those values as well. And that ta and that might mean talking to our friends and being like, hey, you know, like, because sometimes you have friends make jokes right like maybe hey this joke isn't cool or like hey maybe we can we can make a mutual aid group or make an, uh, a a political education group of some sort maybe we make a study circle maybe we all are like kind of interested in this stuff let's let's make a study circle you know you know that's still important so uh here we go we got we got, we got to almost two and a half hours probably closer to like two hours and 15 minutes because there's a lot of uh, just me being uh doing a long introduction, me being boring at the start, but um, I think that'll do it for session two. I feel like uh, we kind of cover what praxis was. Um, yeah, if there's any like um, yeah, intersectionality, um, maybe, maybe that could be a topic in the future. Who knows? Uh, because I only have one more that I kind of like fully fleshed out. Uh, um. I think, yeah. So if you have any, if you have any ideas um, in terms of like subjects, and it doesn't always have to be like a term, like praxis. It could be like, like I said, I think I want to do an episode on like the economic crisis of two thousand seven, and like look at that and read about that and learn things from it. Like, what are some things that happened then that we can do now? You know, like Occupy Wall Street. Like, why was that a success? Why maybe it was a failure or whatever? You know, like did it accomplish its goals? Um, like, what can we learn from those movements? Uh, I think I want to get to at some point because I'm, I'm much more of a history nut than um, than a, a theory kind of guy, but I still feel like we need to establish some words and whatnot and subjects before we go in. 
Uh, I know another word we want, I talked about was dialect dialectics. That's a word I kind of know what it means, but I kind of don't at the same time. And it's been thrown around a lot in theory. Um, but yeah, um, I had, a, I had a lot of fun doing this. Uh, I was a little bit more nervous about this one compared to the last one. I won't lie. Uh, I feel like it went pretty well, all things considered. Maybe there's some things I wish, like maybe I, I had better reading material uh, to talk about. Um, you know, I feel like the maybe I could have had a couple more fun things to look at. Um, yeah, a lot of theory is confusing. I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm doing this too is that I'm in a study circle and we read like a lot of theory and whatnot. Um, and there's sometimes I don't fully understand it. Um, and sometimes I do, and I feel like maybe if we could just talk about it more, maybe we can all come to like at least feel like we learned something, you know. Um, but yeah, I think that'll be it for this, uh, episode here, the session. I keep calling it episode. I want to call them sessions. Cause like I said, episode makes it sound a lot more, uh, production wise, a lot more, uh, uh, well thought out, <laughs> a lot more visually, uh, uh, cool. <laughs> um, but yeah. So, uh, let's see here. I would have ended the recording already. We'll pretend, pretend it ended. <laughs> All right, there we go. Now we're to the ending thing. Now we're to the ending thing. Uh, so yeah, that'll be it for today. Uh, I think the goal for me is always going to try to get these to like around three hours. Uh, a little bit shorter this time, but I think it's fine. At least we passed an hour. Uh, when I first thought of this project, I was really worried that it would be an hour per session, and then it would be real quick and awful. Um. I think I'm going to get better at this hopefully over time. Uh, hopefully it didn't suck. It wasn't too boring or anything like that. <laughs> or everything I said made sense. I feel like you learned something. I hope. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Glad uh, glad you liked it. Um, but yeah, feel free to... Uh, if you have any suggestions, feel free to let me know. Um, whether it's like, hey, maybe put the fun stuff at the end or... I didn't find the reading stuff interesting, or I did find it interesting. Do more of that. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Um, 